Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Byron Show on Betsburts Golf for the Valero Texas Open DFS week. We've got ourselves a interesting field full of names that are rather enticing at the top of the board there, Ron. So we got some some fun names to play before the Masters next week. Yeah, I know everybody cannot contain themselves with excitement for the Masters next week. But yeah, don't sleep on the Valero. This is actually a pretty good field. It's a challenging course. And uh, there's lots of value with the DraftKings pricing this week. Yep. I am loving the $5,000 range. I think it's a really nice new mix to the DFS world we live in. It provides some fun some fun decisions to make. And it's it allows guys to be priced in the 13000 when they should have been priced in the 13000s when there wasn't a 5K range. But hey, baby steps, we'll go with that. Ron? Tell us what you filtered in on the rabbit hole. Tell us what you're looking for on this golf course. Any particular nuances outside of just, you know, the general accuracy of the tee, good from 250 and out, good around the greens, making sure that you can kind of just keep your irons dialed in from 125 to 200 as well. So anything else in that range? Yeah, the quick rundown, man. I mean, it's take advantage of the par fives. Um, You know, the five of the last nine winners here led the field in par five scoring, and these are not easy par fives either. So, Mm -hmm. I think the rabbit hole kind of allows you to look at other difficult par fives on tour and kind of compare. And so that's one thing looked at this week. Um, yeah, like you said, avoid trouble off the tee. Um, one stat we have in the rabbit hole, it's called distance from edge of the fairway. And it kind of measures, you know, drivers of the ball who, you know, when they do miss the fairway, how far are they missing by? And so um, that is a thing that we have in the rabbit hole. Nobody else has. And so, that's a really good tool to look at this week. And then, yeah, just kind of limiting bogey or worse holes. Um, like you said, you know, uh, uh, kind of off the tee here, distance really does not matter that much. And when you look, as long as you're not spraying it off the tee, um, you know, you're going to be fine because uh, really interesting, the rough is among the least penal on tour here. You know, mm-hmm. birdie or better percentage over the last five years when hitting your approach shot from the rough is even higher than from the fairway. So um, there's really not much difference for where you hit it off the tee as long as you are not hitting it into those, you know, the Kevin Na areas where you know, <laughs> yeah. you're going. you can't get out of that that Texas brush that lines, you know, yeah. oak, oak trees that line the fairways, you're going to be fine. Yes. I think that's a good nuance to make a note of then, Ron, is the fact that I saw there was this, uh, a year where correlation for distance was negative, which is one of the craziest things, you know, you don't, have, don't often see that and it doesn't really actually make sense, but it is important to note that this course is like friendly off the tee, but if you are in trouble, like if you hit a really bad tee shot, you're in trouble. And I think that's what this course's defense is. You can make a quick 16 like Kevin Na. So fun situation there. There is to me, Ron, I believe a weather situation that we got going on. From what I understand, you want to be targeting guys going off PM, AM. From what I see, there should be some weather coming up. Not weather, but wind picking up in the afternoon on Friday with Thursday being most mostly breathless. Is that is that what you're seeing as well? Yeah, I completely agree. So it looks like right around 11, 12 on Friday, you know, winds kind of pick up and get into that, you know, 10 to 15 mile an hour range with gusts um, 20 to 25. And so, yeah, it's pretty calm early in the morning. And, you know, Thursday's pretty good all day. So I think you got a group of golfers if you look at who's teeing off early on Friday. Um, you know, I'll probably put it at maybe somewhere around a 65, 35% edge uh, to that PMAM wave right now. Yeah, it definitely helps. And, you know, it might not help for one specific golfer, but if you are rostering all six golfers in that range, you know, you're getting that that cumulative edge, you know, when you're stacking. You know, I think that's where the stack really helps. Just rostering one or two guys from a random wave doesn't necessarily do it for you. You really want to, like, commit and and, like, power in numbers situation, right? That's how weather stacking really helps. Um, But at the same time, I don't know how severe like the wind is going. There is wind, you know, double what we should see in the morning on Friday, about what, 14 miles an hour or so that you're seeing run versus the six that the guys will have to deal with. And that wind is exponential when it comes to difficulty, right? You know, like you get a six mile per hour wind, that's hardly any different to zero wind. For these professionals but the moment you just go from six to 12 that changes the whole dynamic that's a full club at least in most instances and then once it goes into 24 mile power range that's it changes it up entirely right so just a little wind stuff there for you guys before we kind of dive into the slate and, and chat about Rory McIlroy and Hideki Matsuyama going off in the morning 
I believe, on Friday. You know, if you take a peek at their round one tea time, it's 108 and 119 for the afternoon there. So those two guys, the only options until you get to Jordan Spieth that are going off in that preferred wave, Ron. So hit me up with your favorite plays in the 10s and up to nine and a half with Jordan Spieth. Oh, so you're assuming I'm not playing Rory. Is that correct? No, um, I know you're playing Rory because he's in the good way. He's 12-3. You, you're yeah. a big fan of the big dogs. Uh, look, I was. I had no intentions of playing him when the week started. You know, um, we've all seen kind of how inconsistent he's been. You know, I don't think he even has a top 15 recently. Has not played at this course either for a while. And so, you know, but what, what kind of got me is, you know, you kind of have this 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 notion people have, you know, when you play the week before a major, some of these elite players, they're just going to be, you know, trying to work on their game, trying to maybe practice shots they're going to see at Augusta next week. But, yeah, when I look back and I pulled up the, the stats, you know, the data from, you know, when, when Rory plays the week before a major, you know, when you look, he's Wells Fargo, final start before the 2021 PGA Championship, he wins. RBC Canadian Open. Final start before the 2022 U.S. Open, he wins. Last year, Scottish Open, week before the Open, he wins. And so, you know, he's in the good weather draw. He feels good about his swing. You know, he got some good input from Butch Harmon. Um, you know, he's gained with the putter in 13 of his last 15 starts, which, you know, that says something. And so, you know, um, maybe this might be a thing where I try to be even with the field. Um, but I think, you know, this is not an elite overall field. And so I think, you know, he's got a good chance to kind of repeat what he's done here in the past. And so I will be playing Rory. Um, you want to, you have any thoughts on that before I go on? Yeah, I do. Because I think Rory to me is a guy I will probably start leaning into once Augusta rolls through because it is a major, major mental hurdle for him to deal with. Right. I think all those wins came at events that he's won. He's won the other three majors. I don't know when had he won them prior to that or not, but the Masters has always got away from Rory. He's it's it's arguably his biggest bugaboo, and I think it impacts his overall game. And I think each year we're seeing it get worse and worse. You know, I think he's potentially tailoring his game to suit Augusta. I think it's just an interesting dynamic. And I don't know. I don't think this is the same week as the other three weeks before any other the three majors, which he's won already. You know, like this is the major. I think he's putting too much pressure on himself. So, oh, I don't know. It's an interesting thing, Ron. He's he's the same owned as Corey Connors and Alex Norin. So potentially we'll still play him. But despite, you know, gaining with the putter, like you mentioned, he hasn't finished better than 19th yet. He's had one top 20 and that was a 19th place. Hasn't finished inside the top 10 on the PGA Tour in 2024. Same with the Deki Matsuyama. I'll I'll lead off with him and then give him back to you there, Ron. 10-6, very popular play. You know, he's obviously played well yeah in the past. He's only had two top 10s in his last 12 starts. Yes, they have been the most recent, but like I'm not going to go overly concerned with Hideki Matsuyama because it's just the week before the Masters as well. You know, I just don't trust this guy leading up to the masters so i'll probably play him a bit at the masters but that's about it i think i'm out on him i'm out on ludwig from a a wave stack perspective maybe i'll lean into him if the weather kind of impacts his ownership but he's looking very popular too there's a good chance i just dive all the way into the nines run you know that's kind of how i start my week we'll wait and see there but um i do want to take back that i said i'm out on ludwig i might be in on him ownership dependent you know this afternoon yeah, you made some good points on Rory, so I'll give you that. Um, for Ludwig, for me, like it's it's just amazing when you dig into his his stat profile and what he's done. You know, even when it appears he's not playing well, like at API, when he lost four strokes on approach, you know, he still finished twenty fifth. In his last twelve starts, he's finished outside the top thirty only one time. You know, for a young player, on courses he's never even played before, it's just amazing consistency. And you know, so this week he's off the tee game with you know those arrows. He just plays off the tee, his length and his accuracy, I think should set him up really nice here um, with much closer approach shots into these firm greens. You know, he's used to these swirling Texas winds from his time at Texas Tech. So I think there'll be some comfort level here. Even this is a course he's actually played in 2022 when he uh, did not have a good showing. Uh, but uh, I think he's someone who I think, again, you need to at least try to find a way to get him in your lineup. Um, I think uh, a potential pivot down here, as we like to say, 
uh, Colin Morikawa. A lot of people are out on him at 10-1. Even with his struggles, I still have him as the second best ball striker in this field behind Corey Connors. And again, with distance off the tee, um, with around the green difficulty, not having maybe as much impact this week, I'm seeing 13% ownership right now. Um, so he's a guy who I think is a decent pivot um, who has some win equity. What is your time frame and what data are you using for your ball striking run? Because someone said earlier this week he's an elite ball striker, elite iron player. In my opinion, he's no longer elite. He might be good, but Colin Marikawa has lost his touch, especially with the long irons. Yeah, so what I do is I take a mixture of um, long-term and short-term and kind of fuse those together. Um, and yeah, if you look at his recent numbers, um, he's lost on approach in three of his last four. Um, but when you go, you know, he's had, he's had a few blips like this early in his career and, you know, I'm not, I guess I'm probably banking on a rebound this week, you know, which I know a lot of people don't like to do, especially when he's had some, you know, 45th at the players, miscut at the Arnold Palmer, miscut at the farmers. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of banking also on his ownership, continuing to dip, lower as the week goes on and hopefully we can catch something there cool i i'll add to that and say i'm out on colin this week but i'll be going to max in a similar instance similar situation not nearly as owned as the other guys in this range hasn't been playing as good as them but max has still been repping out top 20s like pretty pretty religiously despite not having his a game where you know with colin when he's struggling you don't typically see him you know doing like a good professional grind, blue collar grind, right? Like when he's, when he struggles, he's out, you know, he just peels out. Whereas Max hangs in there and I feel like that's going to be beneficial. They are playing together, which should be a fun time. The two Cal bears going at it. Um, we'll wait and see how they, they, you know, go through there, but I'll be playing Max. You know, he is in the crappier weather, but it is what it is. Um, in the nines, my number one guy is going to be Jordan Spieth. I know the course history is big time here, but in GPPs, I think I will be leaning on him quite severely because he provides you with that upside. You know, you're looking for guys to kind of find themselves in the mix. Jordan Spieth, folks, has finished inside the top five in 22% of his starts. You know, that's just incredible. When you think about Hideki in his last 12, start, 12 months, has only finished inside the top five 5% of the time. So there's like a significant upside advantage playing Jordan Spieth. Now, Jordan Spieth, has the worst made cut percentage of everyone in this range too. So that's what you're getting. You know, like, don't play Jordan Spieth in cash. You want to play him in GPPs, in big field contests. He makes tons of birdies, makes tons of bogeys, scrambles his face off, will tilt your face off. He'll make you want to peel your eyes out. Everything under the sun that can be frustrated will be with Jordan Spieth, but he can win this tournament. He has done it before. He's volatile. I'm in for it. What's your take on Spieth, Ron? Yeah, that's a that's a hard pass for me this week. Um, I know he's had some success, obviously here at this course. He's won here back in twenty one. Um, I just think this is a week where he's he's probably desperately trying to get things right heading into next week. You know, obviously everyone knows how how much he loves the Masters. Um, so he's a pass for me. Um, I'm going to go with someone who I know is going to be chalky, um, but when you look at what Corey Connors, you know, TPC. San Antonio is pretty much his second home. Um, two wins here in the past four years. He's gaining an average of 2.33 strokes in his 20 career rounds here. You combine that with his back-to-back -to -back top 20s at the players, the API. This is pretty much as close to a good shock play as I can remember. And at this price, you know, 9,400, you don't even need him to win here. You know, a top 10, you know, will suffice. And so um, I think another guy that um, for me in this range is a really good pivot is Matt Fitzpatrick. You know, tough tracks. That's where you want to play Matty Fitz. And his recent form, when you look, doesn't look great. But when you consider it was just his last start at the players where he figured out he had that extra weight in his driver. And then he goes and he finishes fifth. And he looks like he was just 100% back to where he was before. Um, so that's a really interesting angle to look at. Um, and so I do like Fitzpatrick this week. And for me, rounding out the 9K range, um, you know, Benny on sitting there at nine K flat, you know, he's, he's turned himself into a top 20 player in the world. When you look at his results from the start of this calendar year, yeah. he's been consistent and strong and weak fields. He's gained with the putter in six of his last eight events. 
And when you look at what he's done here at this course, where course history does matter a little bit more this week uh, with some of the nuances um, here at TPC San Antonio, you know, sixth and seventh here in his last three starts. And it's just crazy to me that everybody's kind of jumping off, you know, the Benny on bandwagon. And, and, and if you look, it's just, it was one bad round, you know, that second yes. round at the players um, where he lost almost eight strokes, you know? And so if you look past that, you know, he gained two and a half strokes in the first round, yeah. you know, at TPC Sawgrass. And so I think people are overreacting a little bit to that one bad round, which is dragging his, his data down a little bit. I love Benny on Ron. I, you know, one of my newest appreciations in life is when a co-host of mine is busy just blowing steam up the skirt of a golfer I'm a big fan of and saying all the stuff that I love about it and some other new stuff that I wasn't quite, you know, familiar with about my guy. And Benny on is that dude for me at $9,000, 50, half my lineups at least this week. I've got him ranked second in my model. Love the course history. I will be pivoting around him at $9,000. He gives you that opportunity. And I, I'm zero concern about his upside. 18% of his starts are top fives. 27% of them, a quarter of them are top 10s. One in every four starts in the last 12 months, he's finishing top 10. You know, that's what you're looking for from a golfer. And at $9,000, you're getting that from him. So give me all of that from Benny on at 9K. I've bet him top 10. I bet him to win. Let's party with Benny. I think he's so good around the greens as well. You know, he's a very underrated uh, short game specialist when it comes to that. So lots of fun with the Benny on play there at 9K also gets the good weather. Billy Horschel, Ron. I bet Billy Horschel at the Cognizant and 200 to 1. He's now 30 to 1 to win this week at the Valero Texas Open like four weeks later. His game has been moving in the right direction. We were early on him. We couldn't capitalize on any of his good, good, good finishes. But it seems like he's a popular play this week going off in the bad weather at the top of the 8K range. What are we doing with Billy Horschel? What are we doing with Alex Noren? I'm seeing Brian Harmon at about half the ownership of Alex Noren this week. So... To me, that is the pivot I will be making with Brian Harmon. I've also bet Brian Harmon top 20, top 10, top 5, and to win this tournament. I'm all in on these two guys. I'll be playing tons and tons of lines up, line ups with Harmon and Benny on in them together. I think that's a very starting point for me that I want to like capitalize on that value and then just load up with these guys in the 7s and 8s and just see where that goes. So um, that's pretty much my, my take on this range here for the most part. Yeah, I don't have many guys in this range either. Um, you know, Harmon is a guy who has typically struggled the week before major, losing strokes in 26 career rounds. But this price is just too low. I mean, 8.6 for a guy who's who's practically top 10 in the world. And considering how he's kind of taken his game to another another level this past year. Um, so I think this is great value on Harmon at 8,600. What's 8, his ownership you seen, Ron, for Harmon? Uh, I'm seeing 14% right now. Yeah. And Naren? So... I got Norton at 21. Yeah. Um, and so, Why? yeah, like. Why? Why is that yeah. the case? And I, I mean, look, I like, I like, I, I agree with you that Billy Horschel has really been on a heater. Um, I'm still not going to play him when he's approaching 15% and he's more expensive than Brian Harmon. Like, that's just an automatic fade for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm out on Horschel. I'm out on Norton. Um, I'm dipping down here even more. Like, Tom Kim, another guy who. You know, not playing well, but let's not forget, this guy has three wins in his two years on tour, all on courses very similar to TPC San Antonio, two which, you know, which yeah. rewards ball striking accuracy. And so um, I just, I think I'm looking for ceiling plays, you know, once we start getting into down in this range down here, win equity. And so I think Tom Kim is a guy who, yeah, he could miss the cut. He could also pop and get into the top five here. So um, I love Tom Kim. And then I think Russell Henley, you know, coming off, you know, he had this made cut streak uh, 11 in a row was broken at the players. But again, he's still, I know we, we argued about him last time with he's kind of turned into this great short game player and his, his ball striking has been suffering. You know, I'm going to go back to him this week. You know, he's still got two top fours this year. I think he's another player with some pretty good value at 8,200. I'm on a course that should fit his game. And so um, I'm watching his ownership. I'm seeing him right at about 14, 15% as well. So I may come off of him if that doesn't drop or if that goes up anymore. But um, I'm seeing it, 10. You're seeing 10. Okay. So, so yeah, that's that to me is fine. I'll take anything, you know, in the 10, 12 range for Henley, especially when the likes of English and Rye and Bears are in the 15 range, right? That's 
that's fine. You know, give me 5% less than those dudes and we're in. Um, love that. Um, some other names, Ron. And just to kind of double down on Henley there, he's an interesting character to me now. Because of this whole change in like profile, with the short game now being like pretty good and the iron and the driving not like as reliable as it once was, he makes a bit more of an interesting DFS play, doesn't he? Because I feel like the consistent, like I just said this the other day with, I don't know if it's validated or not, but to me, good ball strikers provide a good floor, whereas good short game specialists provide a high ceiling. Does that like make sense? Because you can gain so many strokes chipping and putting any given day, but you can just repeat those good iron play drives, you know, nonstop, but it's difficult to gain tons and tons of strokes with the driver and the irons. You know, the iron's a little easier, but the short game is definitely an area you can really, really spike with, make tons of birdies with. Russell Henley, to me, is approaching that realm, right? So now in GPPs, I'm in for some reason. You know, like I've, it might be the thing that he needs when the irons show up. He's still got that good short game now. So we'll wait and see. Um, I'm in on Russell Henley alongside you there. Christian Bezade note, sorry, one more guy. I love Tom Kim. Ricky Fowler at sub 5% at a golf course that he's got phenomenal track record at is someone I might be interested in. Do you have any takes on Ricky Fowler with three top 20 finishes in his last four starts here, Ron? Yeah, I mean... Even when he wasn't playing well, he was finishing inside the top 20s, yeah. Yeah, but his... Like, I, I cannot take an 8K price tag on him when you look at, like, these are his these are his recent finishes. 68th, 36th, 41st, 35th, miscut, 47th, miscut, 56th, 64th. So he does not have a top, anything better than a top 35, and we're going on six months here. So, yeah, I, I, I know... I'm usually on course history, but I, I can't get there with him this week. I know this is a really weird thing to say as well, but if you take a look at Corey Connors' recent form, it's only like a few spots, 10 to 20 spots better. I know that's a lot, but it's not like neither of them are providing incredible upside, but they both have very similar course history outside of Ricky not having won it twice. But just saying, Ricky is going to be a fifth of Corey Connors' ownership, and they have a very, very similar track record at this venue. You never know. I just, and he goes off in the nice weather. Christian Bezade note, $7,900 top of the range here. Get some good, good weather advantage too, going off in the nice weather split. Bezzy is one of the best iron players in the world. He's now working with that fit for golf guy, Mike, where he will be working on his distance with speed training, etc. That's exciting to me. If Bezzy can start hitting drives over 310 yards with the rest of his game, gee whiz, Ron, that's an exciting prospect to think about especially on the American PGA Tour. So until then, we'll see what Bezzy gets up to. This golf course suits his game perfectly, in my opinion. Um, the distance off the tee is nullified, essentially, and he's a very good you know, short game specialist when he's feeling it. The iron's playing great. Aaron Rye, also a very good iron player, will be playing him despite going off in the morning, despite the ownership. He seems to be finding some form with you know two top 20s in his last four starts with the seventh at the Houston, a very similar kind of venue despite, you know, um, it being a longer golf course. This is a long golf course, but the shots aren't necessarily that long over and over and over. It's just a few very long par fives, Ron, which I think changes the distance of this venue, right? That is that correct? Would you agree with that? Yeah, and so a guy like Bez, who, you know, it, when a lot of players are going to be hitting a third shot as their approach into these par fives, I think that kind of levels the playing field for him a little bit as well. Yep. Yeah exceptional wedge play and that's the thing we see this massive split between 250 yards and out and these wedges to me that seems like two separate sets of golfers i don't think the same golfers hitting those exact proximities we're seeing guys that are laying up on those par fives hitting those wedges and the guys hitting those long irons from 250 out are going for the green so just bear that in mind when you are looking at this if you've got a long hitter that's not a good wedge player that's fine because he's likely going to be avoiding those buckets with, you know, the par five scoring going with the three woods into those greens. And then if you've got a bad 250 plus guy, that's a good wedge. He can dominate those par fives with the wedges in that respect. We've seen Matt Kucha short hitters, you know, just take care of it that way in the past at this golf course. So lots of fun in that range. I'll be playing Eric Cole as well. Keith Mitchell at $7,600 just provides you with some safety. You know, I don't know if he's ever going to find himself 
hanging around the top of the leaderboard for four consecutive days is Keith Mitchell, but he does, you know, provide you with some some safety there. And then we just get a ton of guys going off in in the bad wave, Ron, right around seventy five to seventy three hundred dollars. So any of those guys you got your eye on? Let me tell you something. We are on the same page this week. So if I'm looking at the top half of the seven K range here. Uh, but Zayden Hood is one of my favorite plays. When you remove off the tee data, he's the best player in this field, short and long term. Like <laughs> he's got four top four top thirteens in his last eleven. Mm -hmm. Like you said, he's turned into an elite approach wedge player. I think we can make some comparisons to Steven Yeager last week. You know, just like you know Yeager was trending up for a while. I think Bez is in the same boat here. You know, he's a dark horse to win, and which he needs to get into the Masters this week. Yeah. Um, Aaron Rye, you said it. You said it well. World class ball striker. His ceiling was raised last week when he finished his seventh, so that's exciting. Um, Eric Cole, you know, finishes eighth in my model, and so I'm going to be on him again at, you know, nice. pretty decent ownership. I'm seeing right around 10 11%. Um, and then, yeah, Keith Mitchell, two recent top tens, you know, his approach game is trending up. And so those are my four guys in the upper, and I'll take the lower here. So Maverick McNeely, you want trending upward. He's got seven straight weeks where he's gained total strokes. He's got three top 13s this year already. Ninth at the players. He's accurate off the tee, one of the better short games in this field. Um, Lucas Glover, 7-3, another great value. He's the third best ball striker in this field. If he simply averaged with the with the putter, he could be in the winning lineup this week. And I'll go down to Austin Eckroth, 7-2. You know, he won the Cognizant. And his ball striking has carried over. It's not like he had this drop off after winning. You know, he's gained over seven strokes on approach his last two. You know, he's only got one missed cut in his last 11. So love to see that consistency from Ekro. And finally, um, Brendan Todd is going to be my other play down here. Every week, this seems to happen. You know, he's in the top 15 in my model this week again, you know, 7 1. And when you think about it, you know, he does fit kind of the course profile here. You know, he's. Very experienced on these type of tracks, and uh, I'm going back to him also at 7-1. Yep. The the only concern with me with Brendan Todd is just the lack of repeated upside. I bet him top 40 at plus 115. That's how I'm going to be playing Brendan Todd. Maybe, you know, if I need a safe guy in a very volatile lineup, I'll take him. He's ultra safe, but, you know, the, the sixth place at the API was – kind of an outlier in my opinion you know he's not necessarily kind of showing up at the top of the board as much as you would like but he does fit this golf course quite nicely before we get out this range run some numbers some names some guys victor perez is someone that's been kind of flirting around the top of the leaderboard the last little while he's a very interesting candidate here we'll wait and see what he can get up to sam Ryder. i had an outright on sam Ryder at this golf course last year finished i think second or fourth it was a close call. We like the course history aspect of this venue. He obviously has played, finished third year last year. So that's the way to go. He's had some good form entering the week. He's $7,000 flat in the crappier wave. That's whatever. You know, if there's a guy in a crappy wave, I'll play him regardless as long as I'm stacking a few more, you know, good weather waves in that lineup too. Um, we'll see what cooks over there. One more name I want to mention is Mark Hubbard, just playing so well. So some seriously good stuff. Let's get into the sixes where we have the 6K draft for us here, Ron, where we have what? We're going four guys, three of them from the six, one of them from the five. Yes, sir. You barely edged me out last week, so you are officially two and one on hey, I see, our little theories. I see someone on your screen behind you there. First time ever I've seen. That's a Phoebe Buffet appearance. Phoebe. Nice. She's my baby girl. She um, she always sits there and keeps me company during the day. It's uh, she's my baby. She's the Caitlin calls her the supervising manager of Back Nine headquarters. So she's done an amazing job. Ron, go ahead. Which dog are you taking in the six K? All right, I'm going to jump down here a little bit to make sure I get this guy um, at six three. What if I told you there is a guy who, in his last four starts, has finished twenty first, seventeenth. 26th and 10th three of which are on difficult courses okay that that player would be matty schmidt at again a extreme value here in my opinion the thing that has me really excited for him is he made a swing change the week before puerto rico when this little streak started and he has been lights out ever since and again he's, he's kind of this bomber off the tee but he has this very underrated short game 
And so um, I'm hoping this is not the week it all collapses for him because this is his seventh week in a row playing. Oh, wow. uh, but I just, I just think, again, the role he's on, I- I'm not going to get off now. I've been on him the last few weeks, and uh, he's rewarded me, so I'm going to stay on him. Good. He He's interesting, man. And when you see just a random – when there's a point in time where you see a significant change in someone's game, you, you jump in, right, because that's substantial. Someone that has also done the same thing, Ron – the Russell Henley gang, they just go into the same club and they the same cult. Martin Laird used to be one of these guys, very, very good iron player, accurate off the tee, kind of like in the Russell Henley mold. Martin Laird, over the last little while, folks, if I told you Martin Laird was the ninth best around the green player in 2024 and the 32nd best putter to be the seventh best overall short game specialist in the Valero Texas open field, would you believe me? No, I wouldn't believe I, I'd validate this. Like, but this is what Martin Laird's up to right now. He's changed his game around. An emphasis on around the green play here. Martin Laird has won the Shriners and he's won here in the past. So I've got a Martin Laird outright. I've got Martin Laird heavily rostered at $6,100 run. Goes off in the nice wave. He's sneaky. You know, he's got that short game firing now. It's kind of interesting to see what he's been up to with that. So Love what he's doing and hits tons of green and regulations just, you know, from the the general proximities we're going to see this week. Let, let's snake it this week. So you get you take the next pick. We'll okay. I, I think a snake draft was more fair. So go ahead. Cool. I don't mind that. Let's go with a guy by the name of, I'm going to go with Nate Lashley at $6,200. Volatile, risky, scary. But $6,200, we're going to get a Nate Lashley, folks, who, by the way, has had himself a 13th and a 21st in his last two starts. He's playing good golf right now. He's $6,200. He's cheap. It's going to be a little bit more popular, but I like what Nate Lashley's up to. I'm going to come up to the top of this range a little bit here. A guy who has not played well his last three starts, um, Patrick Rogers. Taking a chance here, 6,800. You know, he was fifth here last year. He actually held the outright lead, 36-hole, 54-hole lead here. Kind of still searching for his breakthrough win, um, but I just think he is a bit underpriced, and so um, I'm going to take Patrick Rogers. Okay. Going off in the bad weather, but he's he's good. I mean, the fifth place will be interesting to see if he finishes up there. We'll wait and see. All right. All right. My next guy here, um, another guy I think is just really mispriced, Andrew Novak, sitting there at 6'5". You know, he was also ninth there last year. He's gained three-plus strokes ball striking in five of his last six. Um, whatever changes he's made coming into this calendar year, you know, have been working, you know, four top 17s in the last two months. So, yeah, another guy who's going off early um, in the morning on Thursday. Uh, but I, I just think he's a guy who could easily be in the 7K range this week. Yeah. Totally agree with you on that. I mean, he's, I think I've got a top 10 bet on him again. I just think he's, he's one of these guys that just pops. So he's firing. Let's see what he can do. I'm right there with you, Ron. We agreeing far too much this episode, aren't we? It's, it's ominous. It either spells doom or it spells, we are going to be zooming up that leaderboard. So let's go with the second, right? Um, Someone that goes off really early on Friday morning. Someone that has been ball striking the crap out of it. He's in fact had got the 17th best ball striking in the field in his 14 shot link rounds. $6,400. Bud Colley, 21st at the Cognizant, 45th at the Houston, missed the cut at the Valspar. He is a very good golfer that has only played, what, a few times, four times since his debut at the Waste Management Phoenix Open. And he's made three cuts. You know, like to take that amount of time off from golf and then just show up on the PGA Tour and just make those cuts and and find himself at the Cognizant. He was in the final group, you know, like so he's he's been flirting with he's got that upside. He can just hang around. That'll be better. But the rust is is still coming off of Bud Cowley. And before we know it, I would I'll be willing to say that Bud Cowley will be an eight thousand dollar golfer by the end of the year. So give me Bud Cowley at sixty four hundred bucks in Texas. All right, you're so ma- oh, now you're making your five. 5k, 5k range, 5k range. You know what? I'm gonna keep it simple, keep it sweet, and I'm gonna go with oh, I almost 
pulled the trigger on someone that I might not necessarily like the most. I'm going to go with Aaron Badley at $5,900. We've got two top 20s and a top 30 in his in his last three starts here. He's one of these guys that's just safe on these shorter coastal tracks. When the wind blows, he tends to do his thing. Badly gets the nice weather wave. He's been fantastic around the greens in his career. And, you know, that checks out because he's played well here in the past. So not don't expect anything better than a top 15 or a top, you know, like a 15th place finish. But he's $5,800, $5,900. He, he should help you get those six for sixes through hopefully this week. All right. I was worried you're going to take my guy. I, I, I don't think you like this guy uh, usually, but um, 5,500. I really love this play. I don't really like much ever in the 5K range, but Grayson Murray, okay. He, obviously, we all remember he won the Sony early in the year. Had a really rough stretch, four or five starts where he was just horrible. Yeah. But we've seen a rebound, 25th yeah. at the API, 42nd at the players. He was 16th here at TPC San Antonio in his only trip. And so I think he has the upside that we are looking for in the 5K range. I agree. And he's ultra impressive around the greens too, Ron. You know, like that's the thing with Murray is when it comes to scrambling, he's incredible. Um, yeah. Any other mentions in this range, Ron? I, I want to chat about Kevin Doherty. I know the course doesn't quite translate to his power, but guys with power still have good long iron play and they'll kind of keep themselves in play as best as they can. He's $5,500. He's one of the cheapest dollars per point I have in my model this week at $8,900 per the points he scored on the PGA Tour. Rafael Campos. I'm going to go back to him. He had one. I think he played terribly, terribly at the Houston Open. I had him in a lot of lineups that had Steven Yeager. So that didn't work out for me. But hey, I will be going back to my guy. I have faith in him. He's a ball striking beast. Let's see what he can do. Rafael Campos. That's my guy. Yeah, a couple. So, again, I'm doing 150 lineups this week. Um, I will spray some of these guys on here probably around. I'll just put them right at 5% and make, kind of mix and match. But um, yeah. agree with you on Docker. He had 5,500. Um, I think there's some really decent names here. Like Sam Stevens was second here last year. He's mm -hmm. 5,800. Um, I think Michael Kim, we've seen some upside with his game. He's 5,800. Um, going down the list a little bit. Um Let's see. I've got, you know, Matthew Neesmith, you know, a guy who can can definitely get you a top 40 down here at 5,500. Um, so, you know, those are a few names. Uh, Parker Cootie, you know, Texas kid, mm -hmm. 5,600. Um, so, yeah, there's there's some definite names down here. I even think Lanto Griffin has shown some some made cut consistency and he's sitting there at 5,400. So those are a few names that I'll be playing for sure this week. Um, Lanto Griffin has had incredible course history, Aaron. I know you love your course history yep. guys in this cheap range. He is one of the top DFS point scorers on average at this venue. I just tweeted that out earlier this morning. He's He's been playing well and showing some form again. You know, I think he's coming off of a hip injury, I believe. So good for him that he's showing some of that. Um, you never know which week it is where these guys with injuries kind of finally return back to the form they once showed when they were healthy. So a lot to like about Lanto Griffin there. Awesome stuff, folks. Phoebe made her first appearance on the Byron DFS Betspert show. It is the Valero Texas Open. We've got a lot going on. Go check over at Twitter, aka X. I will have all my stuff coming out later this afternoon. We've got tons and tons of stuff there at the Model Maniac. Ron is at PGA Splits 101. Go follow all his wonderful between the two of us, I mean, there's not too many people on, on X that could put a duo of just beautiful information out there. Not to blow my own horn, but to blow yours at the same time, too. But, you know, we really provide some really good stuff. So give us both a follow out there if you aren't already doing so. Um, anything else that you got going on for the rest of your afternoon before the Valero kicks off on? Yeah, DraftKings article coming out. Uh, we got ownership, um, first round leader stuff. Um, there's some really cool things that you can do with first round in the rabbit hole. I'll uh, look up AM, PM scoring averages, you know, you know, looking at, you know, historically how guys perform. There are, if you look at the numbers and compare it to baseline, there are some guys who just play better in the morning. Um, I know you need, you need enough sample size for that, but you can actually look at all that in the rabbit hole along with, you know, past first round historical performance, floor ceiling. We have a, a filter for that where you can look for upside players show in the first round. So a lot of cool things you can do. And again, this is probably one of the last weeks the rabbit hole will be at the price that it is. So 
Um, anyone who wants to jump in, we still have that deal with Vivid Picks where you can get in for five dollars um, if you're in one of the states that allow Vivid Picks. So um, yeah, lots of good stuff going on still. Awesome stuff, Ron. Um, yeah, rabbit hole, a beautiful tool, folks, that you need to get your hands on for sure. Um, the Masters is next week, baby. We're about there. I can hear the jingle in the back of my head. It's going to be a fun, fun week. But first, we have to deal with the Valero. Let's have a good week. Don't forget to pivot your face off and let's have a party.